If anyone does not have the source sheet, I worked really hard on this, so please pick it up. Uh, this is fresh meat. I've never done. I've never done this before. Okay, Bishos, the Mardasra, Rabbi Myers, uh, Mr. Mordbar. This is really cheap, but I can't resist. Rabbi Myers walked into a bar, <laughs> and out came the AJT. <laughs> uh, Mr. Barr is the indefatigable engine behind all of this, and we're very grateful to him. Uh, esteemed board members, um, I guess in abstentia, Mary uh, Verebi, Rabbi Apfel, Mary Rabbi cherished colleagues, uh, if in the slightest way my presentation this evening will be a soupçon of a modicum, of a brekola, of payback to all the wisdom direction I received from Rabbi Tversky, I will be very, very gratified. And my heart, my chest burst from pride that the last years of Rabbi Tversky's life, my son, Yoni, got to learn with him on a weekly basis. Nothing in our family we call him we call Rabbi Tversky Moreno. So that was and we have always Moreno Moreno. We, we, we can say Moreno's after Moreno's. Okay, I shan't be saying anything especially profound this evening, just some fundamentals that hopefully can upgrade a lifestyle from civility to nobility. I heard a story from Rabbi Professor Aaron Tversky. This is the brother of Rabbi Abraham Tversky. And it goes like this. The Chassid turned to his Rebbe and he said, Rebbe, I want you to dive and I want you to pray that my wife should die. What? Yeah, I want you to, what are you talking about? I said, listen here, I'm a very poor man. If I have to give her a divorce, it'll cost me a fortune. If she dies, it doesn't cost me a penny. The Rebbe said, I have a better idea. The rabbis teach that if you pledge money to charity and you don't deliver, Within a year, your spouse will die. He said, Rebbe, that's brilliant. So this is right before Rosh Hashanah. They gave him after. He pledged 500 rubles at Stukka. The Gaboyim came on Sunday. He said, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not giving. I'm not giving. That happened Rosh Hashanah time. Ay, 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 ay. Half a year later, it's already Purim. He said, Rebbe, Rebbe, it's already Purim. She hasn't even sneezed yet. He said, hey, I forgot to tell you. It only works if you don't want it to work. Now what are we supposed to do? I suggest you go out and buy her a fancy Delancey gift. He couldn't believe it. He hadn't bought her anything since, but he was desperate. He goes out and buys her a fancy Delancey schmancy gift, and she is so excited. Since the year they're married, she never got a gift. And she makes him a gourmet meal, which he loves. He buys her another gift, and another gourmet meal, and another gift, another gourmet meal. Comes a little time a year later, they're lovebirds. Oi, Rebbe, Rebbe. I don't want her to die. There's a way out. What's that? You have to give the charity. Oh, no. Oh, yes. You have to concretize. So tonight, Bezer Shem, we're going to discuss matters that are readily able to be concretized. My primary source is a wonderful book written by a very close friend of Rabbi Tversky. Rabbi Joseph Tloshkin wrote a book called Code of Jewish Ethics, and I've culled a lot of material from that wonderful book. Everyone has a source sheet, so I hope you'll be using it. Uh, I'm sorry about the typos. Heads up, this is genuine Seamus. Do not dispose of it. Uh, and you'll notice that I quote from numerous, numerous works of Rabbi Tversky, which is done exclusively to show off. Uh, but no matter what, if I quote, no matter as much as I quoted, any tiny fraction is just such a small fraction of enormous corpus of 90 books which he left over for us. So, I guess with all that, we begin. Look in your source sheet to source number one. When one of our children took his first steps, we would call home with the good news, writes Rabbi Tversky. Mother would say, Mazel tov. God grant they should always walk on a good path. So, again, a good I don't know if you ever experienced this, but in Shalayim, I live in Shalayim, and in Geula Meisharim, you know, sometimes you get for and you get lost, and I ask you, Shalmi, for directions I ask in Yiddish. I love the way they respond. They always say, it's like you're saying something so prophetic. They're saying to me, you're going on a good path. And then they tell me to take a left. But I love that they give me this bracha. So when the child would start to walk, they would applaud. 
he should always go in a good way, and I'm going to skip this very uh, despondent anecdote. Of course, you're welcome to read it. And we go to the very bottom. Mother would say, when a child starts wailing, the parents should... Well, should, be, should be walking, by the way. <laughs> should be walking. The parents should say, God grant that justice as his walking is welcome now. His life should always be the gains of the gain frame with him. Wherever he goes, people should be happy to see him. The best way to emulate God, as I hope this talk will make clear, is to become a blessing in other people's lives every step of the way. And without even exhaling, we're going to go straight to the second source. The Pasuk says that if you make a vow, you may not violate your word. It's a prohibition from the Torah to violate what you've committed. And we read, the Talmud states, that although a person may not break his vow, there is a mechanism whereby he can be released from his vow. If a competent rabbinical authority can establish that the vow was made in error, then it can be set aside. For example, if a person in a moment of anger vows that he will never participate, will never again enter a certain person's home, and later realizes that very important functions in which he must participate are conducted there, he may petition the rabbinical court for a release, or we call it a petach in rabbinic language. And the court can establish that the vow had been made without full consideration of its consequences, then the person would, be not, have, would not have made the vow had he fully realized its impact, then they can grant the release. Lahavdil, if you're familiar, this is like an annulment to a Catholic marriage. So, what's the source? So the Gemara says in Shavuos Chav Vav, a remarkable thing, because the Pasuk says, L'kol adam that which any man expresses in an oath. So, the Gemara realizes that you don't have to say man, that which is expressed. So the, the, the conclusion is that if the person made this, had he only considered the consequences and the ramifications, then he would qualify as a person. The logical conclusion to the Talmudic position is nothing less than radical. If one acts without considering the consequences of one's behavior, one is not acting as a full human being. And Arabi Tversky adds, perhaps that's the origin of the Yiddish expression, be a mensch. We should protect our dignity as human beings by avoiding laxity in those features that define us as human. And that's also the source for tonight's talk, what I call honorable mention. In other words, if you don't consider the ramifications and the repercussions of what you're doing, there's something lacking in your menschlichkeit. Okay. Every talk I've ever attended on child rearing, there weren't many of them, always stress how important it is to love your children, which personally I think is, duh. But no one ever stresses the equally obvious that if children are well-behaved, and considerate, and polite, and courteous, and clean up after themselves, it's easier to love them. <laughs> Better behaved children are more lovable than badly behaved children. And here we go to source number three. There is no limit to which Mido's character traits can be developed. And we skip to the bottom line. We cannot lower the standard. Rather, we must constantly strive to attain the highest standards. If someone were to be a Balmidos, a person of good character, moral sensitivity at the age of 15, and then at the age of 20 is still considered that same good person, I would find this morally repugnant. You haven't grown in five years. You haven't excelled. Our job is always to increase and get better and so that you're not the same person today that you were yesterday. We have to train our children to have good manners, not only for sake of those with whom they interact, but for their own sake as well. To raise a child to be unlovable, I find is a form of parental abuse. Uh, I'm not here to talk about child rearing, so don't worry. I am worried about my pages here. One sec. Okay. Instilling good manners means much more than just saying please and thank you. The boy who leaves a tissue soil tissue on the bench, on the chair, on the floor, tells me volumes about how this child or this young adult was raised. 
Minimalistically good manners means not cutting a line, even if you think that your time is more important than someone else's. It means offering a seat on a bus or a train or public transportation to one who is older, to one who, to one who is older or weaker. I'm sorry. I once offered my seat on a bus to a woman that I thought was pregnant. <laughs> And when she told me she wasn't, I was so embarrassed, I said, I'm getting off anyways. <laughs> so I had to pay double car fare. Uh, <laughs> treating even people with whom we disagree with respect and fairness. Let's look at source five. Rabbi Kiva says that the all-encompassing rule of the Torah is love your fellow as yourself. And we skip to the bottom line. The Torah requires you to be tolerant of other people, just as you want others to be tolerant of you. Fair is the operative word. You can argue with people. You can even argue with your spouse, provided that you're fair. The problem is, when you get into an argument, you dredge up everything. And you always do this. The two words you always want to avoid are always and never. But if you stay on the point, that's legitimate argument. The whole Gemara is based on arguments. Beishama, Beishilo, Abaye, Rav, Rav, Shmuel. That's, that's a fair argument. We have to treat those with whom we interact as if they matter. My own little pet peeve. Well, maybe we'll go to the source first to just make it not so personal. Source number four. The Mishnah says in Perki Avos that there are Seven things, characteristics in a wise man, the opposite in one who is highly unwise. A wise man does not speak before one who is greater than he in wisdom, does not break into a fellow's speech, is not hasty to answer. And you can see the end of the Mishnah. So it bothers me. My kids all know this. I don't like when they call up and they say, how are you? As if they really want to hear. Do you really want to know about my tennis elbow, my athletic knee? my nausea, my lower back pain. If you have 25 minutes, no one. So I'll tell you two stories which are true stories because they happened to me. I mean, they could be true anyways, but they happened to me. Someone said, how, how was your summer? I said, my mother died. He said, oh, good. <laughs> and the other story, which is really the same story, he said, how was your trip? I said, I broke my leg. Good, or fine, or whatever. It's disingenuous. If, you're not, if you don't mean it, then, then why are you asking? And this brings us to, if I could create a new term, it would be cell phone decorum. Maybe that's an old term, smartphone decorum. There are times that it is inappropriate to speak on a smartphone. And pe students say they want to speak to me, and as they're talking to me, they're, uh, they're swiping. To me, this is akin, I would speak to you when I'm reading a novel as I'm talking to you. I've been at funerals where a phone goes off. <laughs> Did you ever notice? It's always the jumpiest niggin, the jumpiest tune at, at a funeral, the Adams Family or the, the Monsters. <laughs> so I'm aware of the fact that sometimes you forget to turn off your phone. But I'll never get, how do people take the call? So not all that long ago, I was at a funeral, so that, and someone got a phone call, and I came, and they were talking on the phone. The phone rang, they were talking. So I, at the Shabbos table, I said to my kids, I was at this funeral, phone, phone. And my kids said right away, it must have been a doctor. I said, I don't think this 15-year-old girl is a doctor. <laughs> Providence places you in a crowded bus or a crowded restaurant. People talk so loud on their phone. I've heard people shout intimate things over the phone. You're in a crowded place. People are talking. Why do I have to know all the gory details of your new diet? Or how cute your niece is? Talk. In a public place. I have stories that I could tell you that, I mean, maybe you believe me, but I can't believe it myself. I, I find it a flaw in parenting. People kids pick up their kids in school, and as they're walking them home, they're talking on the phone. That's not the appropriate time to, to be speaking on the phone. Okay, we're going to skip a little bit. Not that you would know. Okay. Uh, okay, when driving, it is appropriate to slow down and allow other people into our lane. I don't know why this is. 
and I'm guilty as anybody else, but driving brings out the worst character in people. And if someone cuts you, my Talmudim and Yeshiva told me, my students told me, that if someone cuts you, you'll cut nine other people to cut them back. That's intelligent at 90 miles an hour. <laughs> now it may be the person who cut you is not a righteous, pious saint, and they may not fast on Bahab, but they're not your enemy. And I looked up the statistics before I came here tonight of road rage, and I've already forgotten them, but I seem to remember that over 70,000 people a year in America are maimed for life, consequential to road rage. It's not worth it. For that nanosecond, or maybe a full second, it's not worth the limb, the neck, the spleen, whatever the anatomy is. We're talking about driving. It's appropriate also to offer a taxi to one who is older and weaker. I don't know about Beit Shemesh, but a big metropolis like Yerushalayim, certainly Manhattan, London, Again, offer a cab to one who's older or weaker, especially on a rainy day. And I'm in the latter category of weaker. I'm always schlepping my books, which makes me not so mobile. And I was in New York a few years ago, and I hailed a taxi. Hey, taxi. Got a ring to it. Hey, taxi. Hailed a cab. And, you know, when you hail a cab, you can't just stop right there. It's got to weave itself over to the side of the road. So, hey, taxi. So, we to the side. So, the taxi finally got to the side. Stopped. I hoisted up the box of books. I'm running to go to the cab, and a girl gets in. I said, hey, that's my taxi. And she said, that's life. And just, just, just in case, that was not the right reaction. But you never know in a me-first society that you can react. That's life. Consideration also means it's a hard one. You know, I'm saying some hard ones. Phone is a hard one for people. Here's another hard one, I'm, but I'm breaking them up, so I don't want to do bang, 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 girl. I'll lose you. <laughs> Everyone knows. Ay, 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 ay. Everyone knows that if I put my hand in your pocket, or if you come from England, in your pocket, I'm a thief. But there is much less awareness that if I make you wait for me, that's also stealing. But it's far more heinous. Money can always be replaced. Time is irreplaceable. In Kola Kavod, that we started tonight on time. This is... I speak a lot. This, this is, I can count them on less than one hand where this has happened. Uh, this show is definitely not New York. I, mean, I shouldn't have said that. Okay. Um, time cannot, so people tell me that uh, I'm not a Yeki. I'm not of Germanic ancestry, nor am I. But I don't want people to wait for me and I don't wish to wait for other people. There's a person in my family who is always perpetually, dynamically late. And I kibitz her that on her matseva, on her tombstone, they're going to write, here lies the late. Um, <laughs> the Chazonish, Chazonish was, for those not familiar, was the, was the undisputed Godel Ador, the most outstanding rabbinic personality. And if this story is true, which I believe it is, then what I'm telling you is not merely a story, but I'm telling you Torah law. And he was putting together a bare-bones minion, minyan mitzumtsam, just ten men. And one man was hemming and hawing. He said, what's the matter? He said, I'm happy to come to your minion. But if I do, I'll be late for an appointment. Said the chazonish, go to your appointment. And he added, you can't daven on stolen time. And that broke the minion. More contemporaneously, my Rebbe Zuchon Lebrach Shlom Zaman Orbach would be extraordinarily grateful if someone would give him a ride. I skipped a source before I get to Shlomo Zalman. Let me do my source. They work so hard on them. I got too many pages here. Oh, there we go. Source six. When Rivka came to the well, this was last week's Torah portion. When Rivka came to the well, Eliezer noted that the water of the well rose up miraculously for her. And the wait in and he waited to see if she would offer to fetch water for him and his camels. By the way, there's a boy, I know the family, this is a boy in Muncie who was starting the process of dating. And his father is an alm and his father's a widower. And just as the boy was starting to date, his father was going to resume dating to find a, a second wife. And the son said to the father, you know, us young ones, we have romance and everything, 
but how will you know if it's the right one? He said, you know, in our Parsha, meaning last week, in our Parsha, there was a sign for Rivka, the, the water rose up, maybe God will send me a sign. So he called up, I know this fellow, and the, the woman that was suggesting him was a student of mine, a former student of mine. He called her up and said, I, I know this is the point in time we're supposed to speak, but my kids threw all the toys down the toilet, the water's coming up, I can't speak to you now. <laughs> and needless to say, they got married. Okay, back to, okay. So it continues Rabbi Tversky in Source 6. <laughs> Rabbi Chaskel of Kumir asked, why was a further test necessary? Was it not enough of a divine sign for Eliezer that the water rose up miraculously, which indicated that Rivka was the designated wife for Yitzchak? Rabbi Chaskel answers, one good deed is worth a thousand miracles. Eliezer was not impressed by miracles. He wanted to see character. Okay, back to Shlomo Zalman. Rabbi Orbach would be so grateful if someone would give him a ride, almost to the point that it looked like he was overdoing it. Now, this will sound strange to you, but 50 years ago in Israel, it was unusual for a religious person to drive. 60 years ago, it was almost unheard of for a religious person to own a car. And the person who told me the story was the first car in Shari Chesed, Shlom Zalman's neighborhood. This gentleman is no longer living. And Shlom Zalman was going to be Masada Kedush and was going to officiate at a wedding out of town. And he offered to give Shlom Zalman a ride. He said, thank you very much. He said, what time should I pick up the rabbi? He said, the wedding is called for 6 o'clock. It's out of town in Petach Tikva. Pick me up at 4.30. Let me first explain to you, had he not had a ride, it would have meant walking from Shari Chesed to Mach Yehuda, his neighbor was Shari Chesed. To this day, there's no direct bus. That's a 20-minute walk for one in good health and good weather. Not always are both of these conditions fulfilled. Then a Mach Nihuda, yeah, 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 waiting for a bus to the bus station. Then in the bus station, waiting for a bus to Tel Aviv. And then in Tel Aviv, waiting for a bus to Petach Tikva. And then in Petach Tikva, waiting for a bus to the hall. All together, four buses, on and off, squishies, kvetch, squishy women. Four and a half hours now, telescopically condensed into an hour and a quarter. Pick me up at 4.30. Now, my own experience, Shlomo Zaman, the Bud Chaim Tovim, his Talbot Muvuk, the Vigdor Nebensal, any time you make up to pick them up, at that time, precisely, they're outside with a safer, never, ever, ever. We have to wait for them. And he's waiting and waiting and waiting. Yeah, 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 yeah. 4.30, 4, 44, 10 to 5, 5 o'clock, 5.05, 5.20. 525, the driver's mosing along. He said, where were you? I couldn't bear the thought. If I would have come on time, we would have arrived at the wedding as the busboys were setting up the table, as the photographer was taking his equipment out of the case. Said Shalom Zalman, don't worry about me. I have plenty of things to do with my time, but we make up a time, we must keep a time. And I don't care if you never give me a ride again at a time that was very hard to get a ride. But we make up a time, we must keep a time. The poor chas and the poor groom there's so much on his mind he has to think about, is the rabbi coming? Is he coming on time? I don't care if you don't get me a ride again, but we make up a time, you must keep a time. Now, if you think, by nature, I'm somewhat impatient, good character is not my strong suit, I don't wear good character on my sleeve, I'm here to tell you that change is the name of the game. Not only me, so is Robert Tversky. Let's turn to uh, source seven. I'm gonna have to read all this to you, pardon me. Reading is not my strength. The first application of Schultz's work in my psychiatric practice occurred during a therapy session with an alcoholic. My patient was a very intelligent man who I had seen on several occasions, who had consistently refused to accept my recommendation for a definitive treatment for his alcoholism. Each time we met, he denied that he was an alcoholic, and although on no occasion was he able to deny the alcoholic-induced fiasco that had once brought him into my office, he continued to insist that he could still drink socially. Each time he thought of some new technique whereby he could prevent his drinking from going out of control. Each time I pointed out that his previous efforts had failed and that his newly devised machination would be no more successful than his previous efforts. On his last visit, I had a sudden inspiration. Sometime earlier, I had resolved to make some changes in my lifestyle in order to reduce stress. Rabbi Tversky's talking uh, 
about himself. One of these was to read no more work-related material during meals. I therefore kept several volumes of light literature in my office for reading during lunch. And these included several volumes of Peanuts cartoons. <laughs> I remembered how Charlie Brown falls flat on his back each time he tries to kick the football at the beginning of each season, each season. And how every year he rationalizes why this year things were going to be different and he was not going to miss the ball. Rationalization is the enemy of character improvement. A person who recognizes that they have erred may one day be motivated to correct themselves. But once you rationalize and justify your behavior, what motivation is there to repent? Back to uh, the love affair between Rabbi Tversky and Charles Schultz. Yet every year, the same thing happened. Charlie Brown did not learn from experience, kicked the football or missed the football, and land on his back. I told the patient about Charlie Brown's annual ritual and let him read several strips. He laughed heartily. And then to my surprise, he said, that's me, all right. Charlie Brown had been able to reach this patient in a way that I could not. As a psychiatrist, I appeared formidable and threatening. The patient might feel that I was accusing him of not trying hard enough to control his drinking. However, Charlie Brown was innocent and harmless. Charlie Brown gave it, gave it his all each time. He really wanted to kick the football with every fiber of his body. It just didn't work. And here we go. He was so masterful in using and employing these cartoon strips to convey a message. Sometimes I'm paid money to give workshops on storytelling. It's a gimmick. So certain federations, they don't, they don't want a yeshiva speaker, but this sounds very parv. So I give them a workshop. And the truth is, is that if you tell someone they're doing something wrong, all the defenses go up. But if you tell a story about someone else, then you can convey that ontological message and they can understand it. Is that not what Natana Navi did to David Amelech? There was a rich man and there was a poor man. And the poor man had one, but one Shepsala. And someone stole, the rich man stole that sheep from the poor man. And David Amelech said, he shall die. He said, Ataish, you are that man. And he got through. So Rabbi Tversky knew exactly how to use this method to convey a lesson. OK. That's, that's just the love affair, how he used it so, so masterfully. OK, here we go. Change is the name of the game. We don't have to wait for Rosh Hashanah to change. We don't have to wait for Elul. What we have to do is commit to improve, to commit this reminds me of a story. Maybe some of you can relate to it. There was a from a religious woman made a commitment to go on a diet, not tomorrow, but today. And no sooner had she made the commitment to go on a diet, and she was driving down the road past the bakery, and there staring, from, staring her from the window was Napoleon oozing custard. Who she said, must be Bashert. <laughs> but then again, I did make this commitment to go on a diet. But then again, God did arrange this fortuitous encounter between the Claire and myself. I know, I'll wait for a sign from above. I know, if I find a parking space in front of the bakery, then I will know it was meant for me to eat the Napoleon. <laughs> and sure enough, on her 14th time around the block, <laughs> she found a parking space in front of the bakery. I want to give you four examples that we can change. It's a new world. I mean, this. I could have told you this pre-COVID, and you would have understood me, but how much more so now? For examples, when I was a kid, I'm 27. I don't know why that's funny, but when I was a kid, everybody spoke Lashon Hara. People gossiped and slandered, besmirched. Nowadays, there's a tremendous awareness. I don't know if my kids, I don't think my kids speak Lashon Hara. I mean, nowadays, <laughs> if someone wants to say Lashon Hara, they'll say, this may be Lashon Hara. <laughs> And then they say it, but that's an improvement. That's, the world has changed. <laughs> I remember distinctly second Seder, I learned in the Mir Yeshiva. Second Seder, there was a petrochemical layer, yay thick, malodorous, odorific, farstunken, redolent. Nowadays, if you smoke, you're a pariah. Out in the cold or in the heat. If you watch a TV show from the 1980s on your neighbor's TV, Everybody's smoking. The world has changed. 
you don't smoke anymore. It's, you're a pariah if you smoke. The world has changed. Another example. And back to the good old days when I would travel to America, good old days, all of 17 months ago, when I traveled to America regularly, my host in Brooklyn was a family by the name of Pashkes. Very sweet people, these Pashkes is. They manufacture candy. Now their core clientele are Hasidim. And if you look at, the, at a wrapper of a Pashkes candy bar, there are more Hechsherim, more rabbinical endorsements and certifications than there are ingredients, with no connection. No shatness, no kinlei bedirabe minei, no kinei divura, erv mafulosh, migulahotzi. There is no connection. Mr. Pashkis told me he's a Jew a couple years older than me. He said that when he was a kid, if you didn't see a picture of a P.I.G. on a candy bar, you ate it. I remember those days. It didn't go oink, oink. But those days are over. You don't put something in your mouth without checking the ingredients. You look for certification. The world has changed. Last example, if you're from England, my lost example. Oscar Schindler was an extremely problematic individual. He was a womanizer, a dishonest businessman, a boozer, an opportunist, a loan shark, you name it, he was it. But at that critical time, he saved nearly 1,200 Jewish lives. And forever after, his name has become synonymous with heroism, bravery, courage, self-sacrifice, synonymous. Like Vaseline means petroleum jelly, and Kleenex means tissues, and Q-tips means cotton swabs. Schindler means self-sacrifice. He changed his name. It's never too late. We can all do this. Good character being a mensch, according to Judaism's perspective, is not merely a virtue, but is the very goal of life. Writes the Vilna Gain, the purpose of life is to strive to break bad habits and improve oneself. Otherwise, what is life for? Our greatest priority should be goodness. But often we get so preoccupied with earning more money than we need, trying to be connected with VIPs. The one time we all realize how important goodness is, is at a funeral. That's the most important legacy left behind. No one wants to be remembered that their counter sparkled and you could see the reflection off the hood of the car and their pool was azure and their tennis court was without leaves. You want to be remembered for the kind of parent you were, family member you were. There's a well-known expression, I forgot some politician said, I learned this from Joseph Delushkin also. No one says on their deathbed, I wish I spent more time in the office. That's no one's regret. It's always more time with the family. Rabbi, pardon me, not Rabbi, Dr. Pelkovitz, who always has something very wise to say, related that he had an uncle, Nathan Pelkovitz, who was a pilot in World War II for the Air Force, American Air Force. He also spoke German. So they used him as a translator, and then he got some important position in the intelligence community, came back to Washington, and he had, I, I think he was a dean in some prestigious school, and he did some other work for the government. He was a person with tremendous accomplishments. And at his funeral, which was a large funeral in the Washington area, not one thing was mentioned about his stellar career. All they talked about was what an uncle he was, what a loving father, what a grandfather, what a man of character he was. That's how we wish to be remembered. Source eight. Chesed, loving kindness, is the distinguishing feature of Judaism, of Yiddishkeit. Animals are known to do acts of kindness with their kin, but no animal does kindness with creatures that it does not know. The one way to become good people is not to think about it, but to do it. The more good we do, the more it becomes part of our nature. The Rambam writes, I'm just paraphrasing, it's better to give 100 pennies to Tzedakot than to give $1 bill, because the more you do it, the more it becomes part of you. The Rambam also says, Vatarach means loving your fellow person means being concerned about their money. I teach in seminary, I gave the example. You brought from America, you brought home this one you know, tube of, I, I don't know what's expensive, uh, Pantene, is that expensive? Yeah, it 
<laughs> Thank you. Okay. You brought your pantene and you cherish it very much. And you know, you spend a little bit. <laughs> and then you go to someone's house for Shabbos and in the shower is pantene. Go. Well, you don't do that. But anyway, so that's a violation of how you're sparing on your own, but you're very large when it comes to someone else's. I heard from my friend Dr. Tepper in the name of Rabbi Shulam Rubin that in the world to come, they don't want checks. They want receipts. Uh, I'm afraid that uh, we have to conclude, so we're going to conclude. I'll just say one last source. I, this is my favorite quote from Rabbi Tversky. I have a, there's another book where he says it much more explicitly, and even though it doesn't perfectly fit into what I'm saying, but I couldn't... Everyone knows this, who knows me knows this from Rabbi Tversky. I say it all the time. If you bear a grudge against someone, or you obsess about someone who gets you so angry, what you're doing is you're giving away your best real estate to your enemy, rent-free. You're giving away your head. And I thought about this like, I said to Kodesh Baruch Hu that once toilet training was over, because I don't think it's, it's possible the person could toilet train and have a perfect Shmon Esrei. You know, you get too for, for, for start and for drate. But I said after Kodesh Baruch Hu, after toilet training, I'm never going to allow anything to mess, mess up my Shmon Esrei. And I messed up this year in May. The Hamas got me so angry with their missiles that I I messed up again, I started thinking the wrong things, but don't give away our real estate, our best real estate, rent-free. It's not my place to lecture to you, but we have a tendency through nuance and gestures that are both overt and covert. But it's human nature to be very warm and cordial and friendly to those that are affluent and influential and powerful and wealthy and much cooler to those that are less influential. You meet someone who's a partner in a law firm with 500 lawyers, wait, 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 that's really impressive. And someone else fills gas in a pump in a gas station. That's not impressive. And then you learn, ah, yeah, 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 that this fancy, the lancy schmancy lawyer is an abusive father and a distant husband, and your image goes down. And the fellow who pumps gas in the gas station is a lovely person. His children adore him. The image goes up, but chaval, chaval, that we're so superficial. I have a friend who passed away from COVID, Yussel Chapnik. He lived in Borough Park in one of those little boxes. And Yussel uh, had a, his house was being painted by a black painter. And so they were taking all the paintings and photographs off the wall. Primarily, they were photographs of Gedoli Yisrael. And the black painter said to my friend Yassel, he said, it, pointing to the picture of the Bubba of a Rebbe, the largest Rebbe in Borough Park, he says, is this your rabbi? He said, no. He said, why isn't he your rabbi? He's not my rabbi. Why isn't he your rabbi? He's not my rabbi. Can we get on with the job? He said, but why isn't he your rabbi? He's not my rabbi. Look, look at the wall. There's so many rabbis, beard painters, so rabbinic looking. This one's not my rabbi. But why isn't he your rabbi? He's not my rabbi. And then he said, he's my rabbi. He said, what the? He pulled out his wallet and ripped out a photograph of the Bubba of a Rebbe. He said, huh? I'll tell you. So one morning, I came. I was painting the house. The Rebbe walked in. He said to me, did you have breakfast? I said, no. He said, sit down. He waited upon me. Then he said to me, I want to tell you something. I knew just what he was going to say. I heard the schmooze a million times. I'm paying you good money. I want a perfect job. And the Rebbe said, we once had a world of perfection. And everything was the way it was supposed to be. But because of our sins, the temple was destroyed. And ever since, we've never had that world of perfection. So I cannot ask you to do a perfect job, but I'd like you to try your hardest. And you know how it is people recommend? He gave me hundreds of his chassidim. No one ever offered me breakfast, but they'll say to me, I'm paying you good money. I want a perfect job. And I say to them, you want a perfect job? There's no temple. How do you want a perfect job? <laughs> Okay, part of being a mensch is knowing when to end. Uh, I heard a story that a fellow was walking in Borough Park. And, uh, he tell, and the guy walked out of the show, he said, Tell me, the rabbi, you still speaking? So I'll tell you the truth. He finished, but he's still talking. Okay, so I just want to end by telling you there were two famous orators, a Greek and a Roman. 
Cicero and Demosthenes, when Cicero finished, they said, great speech. When Demosthenes finished, they said, let's march. So ladies and gentlemen, if nothing else, in the memory of Rabbi Tversky, who was such a stellar example of menschlichkeit and how much we can achieve, let's take what we've tried to convey this evening and let's march. We're going to those holy, high, holy enlightened days of Hanukkah. Uh, so I, the good news is that I finished. I just want to point out, as has been said already, you'll notice in the back there are some books of mine and DVDs, including my film on Rabbi Elimelech Melezhensk, where Rabbi Tversky really has the starring role. Um, we're offering on the books, on everything, a, a special Hanukkah discount. If you buy two, the third one is free. We'll do a little arithmetic. If you do four, you buy four. Two are free. If you buy six, I pay you. Uh, <laughs> either way, I think you'll find them enriching. I know I will. <laughs> and while I have your attention, I just want to, while I have your attention, uh, we just started a podcast called Teller from Jerusalem. I hope you'll give it a listen. You'll find it on every single platform. Thank you, thank you.